Music is um, a universally personal thing. We all have those songs that trigger our memories, that bring us back to happier times, or perhaps remind us of painful ones. We assign songs to events, we make mixtapes to woo girls. Uh, I might have tried to have done that at some point. And we even decide on songs that go on to define an entire relationship. Um, me and my fiancé have a song, um, except it always seems to change whenever <laughs> we're out and about. Um, she'll tell me to listen to something, and I, listen to that, listen to it. It's our song, it's our song. And I'm, isn't that Katy Perry? I don't think that, no, that might be your song, my dear, but I don't think that's ours. But <laughs> whether you're a musician or, a no, or, or not, um, we all use music at some point to express ourselves. And music has changed drastically through the years, but its purpose hasn't. Since cavemen first banged two rocks together to form rhythms, we've used it to document historical events, console ourselves in times of need, or just play and have a good old dance. And where would we be without songs like Blowing in the Wind, Yesterday, or Gangnam Style? It's as much a part of us as the air we breathe. And although these universal messages in, in music remain constant, each country and each region of that country has its own stylistic spin on these sounds and these stories. And the Isle of Man is absolutely no exception. So whether we could... Eschurum smirkurgen as gaum shuni sharen. Merk yon trees daren bocht, van skilje standen. Tom cowl eschuen a kerch, as ilium a christin. I had voice to tie on Savora, than sail cuden as me. It's um, wow. three poor fishermen go out to sea. Stormy weather comes upon them suddenly. The poetry of the song doesn't tell us the actual outcome, rather, it suggests that it wasn't good. You don't have to speak Manx, uh, Manx Gaelic, to be affected by what Greg is so beautifully relaying to us here. You already know from the tone of his voice, from the careful notes he's singing, from the pace or the tempo of the song, that this is a ballad, this is a sad song. Without understanding the literal meaning, you are already relating to it on a purely musical, but human way, you're already relating to it. And this is something that has been instilled in all of us since birth. Those heartbreaking words only add to the emotion in this song. The story it tells is one that would have been so common here on the Isle of Man when uh, herring fishing would have been such an important but incredibly dangerous way of life. And while it's not necessarily documenting a specific historical event, it is a glimpse back at the very real worries, dangers, and uh, the everyday life here on the Isle of Man. And as well as being a beautiful song, sung in our native tongue, it now has depth, utmost in co uh, cultural and historical importance. I'll be the first to admit that I ignored Manx music while I was growing up here uh, on the island. Instead, I seemed to adopt another country's uh, American folk music. I became obsessed with it, all facets of it. But blues music especially, um, blues music it, it gets a bad rap sometimes. It's, it's got its stereotypes, the old withered man on a front porch complaining, um, or <laughs> the blues musician, his epitaph being pegged as didn't wake up this morning. But blues music is a folk music. Uh, it was born from field hollers, the songs of generations of enslaved black field workers living and working in appalling conditions in America's deep south. They sang in groups a cappella to the rhythm of plows, axes, hoes, and to momentarily escape an absolutely unimaginable hell. 
And like all folk music, it documents historical events and the social and political climates of the time. Lead Belly's bourgeois blues protested the discriminating, classist, and racist society of the time. Blind Willie Johnson's haunting recording of God Moves on the Water documents the tragedy of the Titanic. A beautiful slide guitar echoing his deep, rich, and emotive vocal. And just like the gorgeous song that we heard from Greg earlier, these were all songs by the people and for the people. These early American roots musicians not only played blues, but had a vast repertoire of popular songs of the day. The necessary ability to cover a huge range of styles undoubtedly led to the evolution and development of this music into other genres, ragtime, for example. These guys were virtuosos, and I think it's also very important to point out that the vast majority of professional musicians in blues from the very start have actually surprisingly been young. They've been young people. The legendary Robert Johnson, who sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads in exchange for his remarkable musical gift, recorded 29 original songs, traveled an uncountable amount of miles playing around America, all before his life was tragically cut short at only 27. Muddy Waters was recorded by the musicologist Alan Lomax um, for the Library of Congress at Stovall Plantation in Mississippi um, in when he was still in his early 20s, and he was still called McKinley Morganfield. Much later on, Muddy took a 21-year-old Buddy Guy under his wing in Chicago. Buddy went on to become one of the most fero ferocious and influential guitar players in the world and a pioneer of the electric blues. And my point here is that there is not, nor will there ever be, an age requirement for expression. And American folk music is especially interesting to me um, because people of all nations have a hand in its creation. And what makes it really interesting is uh, the mix of things that have uh, arrived in America. The black population brought with them uh, instruments, strung gourds from Africa, later morphed into what we now call the banjo. Europeans, Irish, Scottish, and Manx, and English, brought with them the jigs and reels and ballads on fiddle and pipes. The Italians brought the mandolin, the Germans the dulcimer and the accordion, and the Spanish brought with them the increasingly popular guitar. All instruments so ingrained in American folk music. And the States became a mixing pot for all folk music around the world. And it wasn't just the instruments, but the music and the songs traveled too. My mind is wide open to the fact that this music stretches from all the way over there to all the way over there. And all the way along, you can find, you know, the same song. It's amazing oh, yeah. to what an extent that that's the case, you know. Especially where, um, you know, the, the Irish, the Scottish, uh, the English uh, migrated um, to, to other places, to Australia or, or, or to the United States. Um, yeah, you know, United States, uh, we have very isolated mountain communities, uh, like in, in the Appalachians and the Smoky Mountains. A lot of the inhabitants would have come from the same village in, in England. and. Uh, and, and they go over to, to the States in 17-something. And because they're fairly cut off, they don't really change um, their habits that much. So they're still singing the same songs, they, they still get married the same way, use some of the same dialect from 250 years ago. The folk song collectors sometimes found songs there that, that, that had died out in England or, or were pre better preserved in, in Appalachia. These tunes aren't written down, a lot of them. They're one generation away from extinction at all times. I've been a massive fan of uh, the first two people shown in that clip, Martin Simpson and Richard Thompson, for a very, very long time. Their work crosses boundaries. They meld together a variety of different styles from different countries. And they're heroes of mine because they understand what's gone before them. They understand the depth, the history, and the significance. And then they have gone on to create something inspired by and influenced by, but not necessarily a clone of. And meeting them and, and discussing their approaches has really, really changed the way that I work. 
And I want to talk a little bit about the elderly gentleman who was sitting down uh, playing violin in that clip. Um, his name is Charlie McCarroll. I had never heard him. I had never heard him play um, until we met. But meeting him really changed my life. Charlie lives in eastern Tennessee in the heart of Appalachia and Appalachian music. He came from a musical family. His father was a fiddle player before him, a well-known musician in the area. We've been told we needed to meet Charlie. He was the last of the old-time style fiddle players before bluegrass, before popular country and western. He was a living link to the musical past of this part of the world. And we pulled up to his house and I, I was shocked. Um, this poor man was living in squalor, um, absolute poverty. Uh, his one or two bedroom house, or one or two hou uh, room house rather, was um, dilapidated. It was falling down. There was a putrid smell. There was food all over the floor. Charlie himself couldn't walk. He was turning blind. Um, he was obviously in very poor health. And when we sat down, he couldn't have been more interesting, more charming, or more welcoming. And when we started to talk about music, he lit up. He came alive. He was a different person, absolutely different. And when he started to play, I was gobsmacked. Um, gone was this frail man who'd sat in front of me before. And here was this strong force. It couldn't be denied. He was a young man again. He played tune after tune after tune. He would remember a song from 30 years ago that he hadn't played, and he'd launch into it. It was incredible. The person who introduced us to Charlie was a chap called Bobby Fulcher. And Bobby Fulcher was a musicologist, a great musician himself in the area. And Bobby knew some of these songs that uh, Charlie was playing. He knew the history behind them. And some of these songs were hundreds of years old. They'd traveled with the original Scots, Irish, German settlers to that area. The beautiful thing is Charlie just knew them as the songs his dad used to play. Um, we were supposed to only spend about uh, an hour or, or less with Charlie, uh, but how could we leave? We, we ended up staying the whole afternoon just watching, listening, and learning. It was, it was a beautiful and honest experience. It was really quite remarkable. And it was because he loved it, because he didn't expect anything from it, because he did it for the love of it. It was, he never expected, it, it was, he deserves so much more, and that's, that's what I'm trying to say, is he deserves so much more, but he did it because he loved it. And that's what folk music is to me. It's for the love of it. It's, <laughs> it's for the absolute undeniable love of what you do. It's the telling of stories. It is the preservation of people and events so that they can live forever. And most of all, it's because it's human. It is us. Thank you very much.